So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. Surprise, surprise. We've only been here, what, six, eight months? I taught Ephesians for three years once, so count your blessings. <laughs> we're just hitting the hilltops at this time through. So let's just do what we normally do. We'll go through that. I always want you to understand. Are you ready to start the camera? Yes. I it. Oh, I thought you had. Okay, yes, go ahead. There you go. Now the camera's going. So let's start like we normally do. The author, obviously, is God. He spoke through the writer, but the author is God. This is God's word, and we respect it as that. Um, the writer is the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit. The audience is the church at Ephesus. Um, according to the way it's written, it was to the church at Ephesus. And it's similar to a couple other books in the New Testament, Galatians and Colossians. And, of course, Philippians is in there as well. And he kind of has the same story in a few of these books, just different audiences. Um, this church was located in Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey. So if I ask you where Asia Minor is at any point for the rest of your life, you'll say modern-day Turkey. Amen? Amen? The writing of the book is somewhere between 58 and 62. We're not really exactly sure, but we know it was about that time because of the things that were going on. And it was carried by a guy named Tychicus. And I don't know if you noticed it Sunday, but when we went through Acts chapter 20, Tychicus is member. Uh, is mentioned as being one of Paul's team members that he relied on. And he shows up a couple other times as somebody that Paul could rely on in the New Testament. The purpose of the book is the explanation of the basic principles of the Christian's walk in grace. And we really didn't hit on the walk part. We just were learning about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in Christ, and all of those things are the first three chapters. Then in chapter 4, we begin to talk about the walk. And the book is divided two ways. The first, first three chapters are doctrine, the teachings. The second three chapters are the duty or our response. And so Paul, we're now in that place where Paul is not only teaching doctrine, but he's telling people this is what you need to do. This is what you need to not do. And so he's, he's very pointed about that, about some things they need to lay down. Of course, we're talking about first century Gentiles that are now Christians that have a history and a past that's pretty dark um, with the way pagan practices were. So, reminder of how this section starts. So we're in chapter 4, and it starts off, the very first ver verse says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. So that's, that's the start of this chapter. So, you know, he's taught them all about Christology. He's taught them about Christ. He's taught them about what salvation means, what it means to be in, in Christ. What it means as far as Jew and Gentile being together in one man now and that the, the, the separation between God and man has been taken down. He's done all that teaching. And then now in, in, in this chapter, he starts, okay, because of that, because of all that you understand about the greatness of what Christ has done for you, I urge you to walk worthy of that calling. And so we should recognize, Paul's wanting them to recognize the grace that's been shed on them, the the expression of God's love through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, and, and that should prompt us to a response. We, we should recognize all that he went through for our salvation and it should affect our everyday life. And so, skipping on ahead from 4.1 to 4.17, see, I told you we're moving pretty quick. And, of course, the very first part of that says, Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles. So he's urging them to walk worthy of the calling, and he's urging them to not walk as they used to walk as Gentiles in the futility of their mind. And we talked about how they were purposely ignorant of the things of God. They rejected the, the things of God, and, and, and so they're darkened because of their ignorance. And then we get on down the next verse. There it goes. Um, and then he taught, tells them to put off the old self. Verse 20 says, but that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him the basic principles, but to put off your old self. In other words, that's a command. It's something that we're supposed to be involved in. We're, we're supposed to look at our old nature, our old ways, our old ways of thinking, and say, that's not part of me anymore, and begin to take those garments off. Now, we have a habit of putting those comfortable garments back on, and we need to be reminded on a regular basis to take off the old self, and then he goes on and says, put on the new self. He says, be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. So we have to change the way we think. And that's what he's been talking about the last few weeks is, is changing the way you think. Now he's going to get down to some nitty-gritty, um, which he did. The very next verse 
Um, he talked about living in true righteousness and holiness. And he, you know, he talk, we talked last week about be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down in angry, anger and don't give place to the devil. Which he gets, you know, a pretty good, pretty good piece of our life when we're living in anger. We're, la- we're letting him in when we decide to harbor anger or to be mad and those kind of things. And so we, we let him into our life to affect us. And we all know that it does. Anger can eat you alive from the inside out. And then he goes right on. He's just kind of going to list off some things. He said, so, let the thief no longer steal. I like that how he still calls him a thief, though. He doesn't say, let the ex-thief or the previous thief or the, or the rededicated thief or um, the new person that's no longer a thief. He says, let the thief no longer steal. And, and a lot of people like to, you know, think about that. Um, a lot of people I, I know, um, I think his name is Ron Comfort. He's an evangelist that talks to people about the Ten Commandments. And he says, you know, have you kept the Ten Commandments? And everybody says, well, I've done pretty good. I haven't murdered. He says, have you stolen? Well, no, I'm not a thief. You're not stolen anything? You didn't, you didn't take something that belongs to somebody else at any time? You didn't take a pen from work that you weren't supposed to? You know, he gets pretty nitty-gritty on it. And I said, well, I, yeah, I, I have. I've, I've taken things that, that, you know, I wasn't supposed to, but I did. And so he said, so by your own definition, what would you be called? He said, they'd say, a thief. He said, have you ever told a lie? And, of course, everybody smiles as well. Yeah, I've told a lie. Everybody lies. I mean, you hear people say that. Uh, he says, well, have you ever looked at a member of the opposite sex with lust in your heart? And they would say, well, yeah, I do that. And he said, you know, Jesus says that you're an adulterer at heart that way. He said, so by your own confession, you're a liar and a thief and an adulterer at heart. Why should God let you into his heaven? And that's a pretty interesting way to come at it. But I like what Paul says here. He says, let the thief no longer steal. Quit doing that. This is part of taking off the old self and putting on the new self. The old self would have been the thief. And, you know, we, we can steal, we can rob, we can do things a lot of different ways. Um, we, can, we can tell half-truths to, you know, abuse the truth so that we can get, you know, somebody's money or something from them. Or, or we can manipulate things at, how many of you like self-checkout? I hate them. You like them? You love them. I've, I've seen a lot. I've, and you can do it your way that way. Because the ones they've hired have no idea. Have no idea. But there are a lot of people, though, that they'll do all kinds of things. They'll, they'll take tags off of something that costs $2 and put it on the back of a DVD. And they scan it as they go out. Or they'll have stacks of things and just scan one. And, and so they have to have a lot of security. So there's probably a whole lot more camera force now in these stores that are like the, the Frankfurt Walmart is, is basically self-checkout only. Uh, and so there are a lot of people that find ways to steal things, and, and they think, well, you know, that, that's the risk they took. That I'm gonna, if I, in other words, if I beat the system, good on me. It's your fault. I had a friend that would say that, and I've told you all about this before. You know, he went to his house and he had one of those Japanese pergodas, a big concrete thing. And I said, where'd you get that at? He said, it was down there in the yard around the corner. And, I said, why'd you take it? He said, they didn't have it chained down. <laughs> and I said, but still, it belonged to somebody else. He said, I'm just trying to teach them. <laughs> Same kind of guy would check doors as he walks through the parking lot. Have you ever come out in the morning and somebody went through your vehicle the night before? <laughs> that happens a lot in Lexington. It happened to us. We left it unlocked, thankfully, so the windows weren't broke. Maybe if it had been locked, they'd have left it alone or the, they would have set off the alarm. But they rifled through it and uh, took all my change Got, you know, $2 and a nickel, I guess, in pennies, because that's about all that's in the chain cup. And, and it was probably soaked with Pepsi, so, I mean, that was good on them. Let them have that. But it's like, you know, they rifled through everything. They cleaned out everything. We had to put it all back. The glove box got organized at that point, and we had all kind of things that were no good anymore. They didn't really get anything from us, and I'm thankful. But it's just crimes of opportunity, and a lot of people feel like that's okay. Well, Paul says that's part of your old self. Your new nature in Christ is not a thief. Your new nature isn't that way. And I like what he does with the thief here, which he doesn't really do with any other that he names. He says, um, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, get a job, (laughs) doing honest work. We all amen that. You're going to love when we get to Thessalonians when when Paul says if somebody won't work, they ought not eat. Amen. Okay. I thought I had the right crowd. So, so... So he says, doing honest work with his own hands. In other words, become an honest member of society. 
get involved, get a job. And why do you do this? Not, not so you're not stealing anymore. That one thing. But the other thing is so that now you can help those that are in need. And this is what the only person he tells this of all of them. He says, that you, so that you may have something to share with anyone in need. Anyone in need. So think about that. If you were the thief and, and you got this letter, you, you, you were, you know, dedicated to Christ now and you, you were an ex-thief and, and you're, you're trying not to live that way and Paul comes in and says, great, don't be a thief. That's good. But get a job and with that job, help people that are in need. Do something productive for other members of society. So you see, Christianity has a whole different look at things than, than the, the natural self does. You know, I, I know some, some people that are, that are not born again that are not thieves. They, you know, they don't like lies and they don't like thieves, and, but, but they just don't know, they're, not, they're not born again believers. So they, they've got a moral compass that a lot of people that were without Christ don't have. They just don't have that moral compass because it's, it's almost like survival of the fittest. You know, Darwin come around and said, basically, you know, it's survival of the fittest. And everybody said, well, that sounds good to me. So, you know, I'll get all I can, can all I get, and sit on the can. And if I take it from you, it's survival of the fittest. And, and a lot of people think that way. You know, it's just me being stronger than you are, and that's who, that's who survives in this world. But Christ, the whole teaching of Christ is just the opposite. You put others first. Your focus is on the needs of others, not your needs. You let God take care of your needs, and he will. Amen? Has anybody got that testimony in your life, how God is taking care of you? Amen. Yeah. I know a lot of people say, well, no, I, you know, I got my job, my education on my own. I'm like, no, you didn't. You can't even breathe unless he lets you. It's his air. That's right. Exactly right. You, you can't walk. You can't, you can't think. The intellect that you have that lets you get that advanced education so that you can get that career. That was all God working in your life, working things out as we talked about in class. For those that love God and are called according to his purpose, he works all things out. Good and bad. He works them all out according to his will for his purposes. And so Paul's saying, if you were a thief, quit stealing. But that's not enough. Get a job. And help those that are in need. So you hear here a mission-mindedness that Paul has. That he's, he's telling these people at Ephesus. He, he says, you know, don't just quit stealing. But think about those that are in need. And remember, just after his time in Ephesus, he was collecting money to take back to Jerusalem. Because the, the saints there in Jerusalem were in need. They were, they were being oppressed by Rome. And they were also being oppressed by their, by their Jewish countrymen which Paul had run into all over Asia Minor. They were being oppressed and there was need in the community of Christians. And, and it wasn't a welfare kind of thing. It was because they didn't have that. If you couldn't work, you had to beg somewhere. And that's why there was beggars everywhere they went with their cups. And, you know, they would sit at the Temple Mount because people going in there to worship, they're, 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 they're betting on them having somewhat of a conscience and they'll throw some coins in there so they can feel better about it, if nothing else. And we know that story about... Um, uh, um, was it Peter and John that went in to the Temple Mountain? And Peter says, I don't have any money. That tells you right then, pastors have been broke since they started. <laughs> but he says, we don't have any money, but such as I have, I, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord, stand up. And this guy who'd never walked, stood up and walked, which is a medical miracle. If, if, you just, if it was just healed, it was also, not only was what was wrong with him healed, but his muscles were restored. Everything was restored because you, you ever heard of atrophy? Anybody ever had a cast on for a little while? Mm -hmm. Take that cast off your leg and that ankle's weak and that leg doesn't feel right and, mm -hmm. um, and you can't hardly walk on it for a while. You've got to go through therapy and everything else. But when Jesus healed and we see in this healing, well, they jumped up and began running. They were healed that way. And, and so be focused on those that are in need. Um, looking into those. And then one more slide, and I promise this will be the last one because I don't have any more. <laughs> I didn't make, but I, I, I limit myself because I don't stop if I don't. So a renewed mind considers other needs. And, and listen what he says in verse 29. And this is probably a, a big uh, misunderstood verse in Scripture. It says, let, lo, let no corrupting talk come out of your minds, but only such as is good for building up. Now he's mentioned earlier in Ephesians about building up. Building up those that are weak. Building up those that need help. And he says, as it fits the occasion. So whatever the need is, 
that it may bring, give grace to those that hear. Now, what do we know about grace? How do we define grace? God's redemption at Christ's expense. It's also getting something you haven't earned. Getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. You deserve a whooping, and you don't get the whooping. That's mercy. But to get something you don't deserve, we don't deserve God's heaven, but God gives it to us. It's the grace that comes with Christ, and his sacrifice is about grace. And so what, what Paul's saying here, he says, let no corrupting. Now, this word for corrupting here is the same thing that you would find for rotten fruit. Remember when Jesus was given the illustration of a tree and its fruit? He says a good tree doesn't give rotten fruit. Same word. Same exact word. So the thinking here is, is not corrupting. How many, anybody have a different translation that has a different word? I forget all the different words. King James just said let no corrupt communication. Corrupt, corrupt communication. Yeah. Corrupt, which is rotten speech. Do not use foul or abusive language. Okay. Foul or abusive language. It, Foul language. Unwholesome, that's another one. And all these words hit on the essence of this word. Wholesome um, is, is something that, that brings about good things. Wholesome. You know, we talk about wholesome TV. Anybody missing it? It's hard to find wholesome TV nowadays, isn't it? Um, it, it you know, it's just gone south. So let no corrupting talk. Let nothing come out of your mouth that is rotten and it's going to affect those around you. Now, he's not talking about just, in, he is talking about in general, but not just in general. He's talking about within the church. He's talking about guard what you say. Now, a lot of people, when they read this, they think, oh, well, you know, we're not supposed to use profanity. Well, profanity is actually, you know, it's just basically a sign of a weak mind and low vocabulary. Because people with a good vocabulary can cuss you out with every, out, ever using one profane word. They're just good at it. They can, they can lay you down and run you over, and you won't even understand half the words they use. Profanity is just a sign of a weak vocabulary. And, and Scripture doesn't really say a lot about profanity. It's just, it's just nasty language, basically. Uh, when, you know, when we talk about thou shalt not curse, it's not talking about cursing as we define, but it's damning somebody. And, and that's what it meant by cursing somebody, cursing somebody to hell or cursing somebody to God's judgment or cursing people like that. So, but, but this, this kind of speech, is, it's, it's not even that. It, he's not saying be careful of the words you use because, you know, some people might not, may find them offensive. He's not really concerned about necessarily the offensive word that people may say. He's more concerned about how you talk in front of people. And, and I think he's kind of leaning heavy towards the gossipy kind of talk, the, the kind of talk that is destructive to people. We've already seen previously, he's saying, lift people up, build the foundation, help people up. And, and so he says, let no corrupt, let no rotten speech come out of your mouth. Look at that, out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. Edification, you're exactly right. So, so our speech should edify everybody that hears it. So if I'm having a conversation with somebody in here and, and we have to hold it at a whisper in case somebody else will hear, that's not edifying speech, is it? If, if it's something you've got to whisper or go outside to say, it's not edifying speech. I used to love when we was in the mountains. There was all kind of guys that want to tell me a joke. And they said, Preacher, we need to go out front before I tell you this joke. <laughs> and I was like, well, if we got to go out front, maybe you shouldn't tell the preacher the joke. It's just the funniest thing how people think. But, but what Paul's saying here is when we speak, our speech should be graceful. It should never tear down. It should build up. And one of the biggest scenarios that I see is younger Christians get around older Christians, and that's how they learn how to be a Christian. And when the younger Christians are around some of the older Christians, they get derailed because there's some old, bitter Christians out there. I can remember one time being at church, and I went, and this guy was preaching, and he was about half Baptocostal. I mean, he cleared him a spot and had a spell. I loved it. He was knocking wood off the pulpit. Well, he was in a fairly refined church. I mean, you heard amen twice a year, whether you needed it or not. <laughs> there was almost no laughter. It was just kind of one of those. 
Well, this guy preached, and I mean he preached, and he, he had a real good time. Um, matter of fact, he said the Baptists could learn a thing or two from the Pentecostals. And I thought, amen. <laughs> Let the Spirit of God turn him loose, right? And, and so I was all into it. And I thought everybody was getting as blessed as I was. Well, they weren't. <laughs> because when church was over, they were all in the parking lot and in the foyer blessing him out. They absolutely ate this guy's lunch. And these were people I looked up to because they had positions in the church. Now, I was 25 year old about the, at the time. So, you know, I, could, I felt like I could handle myself. I was grown and I knew it, right? <laughs> Y'all been 25. But those people that I were kind of looking up to because I was getting back interested in the things of God. I'd rededicated my life and I was about a year from being called into the ministry so I was really on fire for the Lord and these people I looked up to because they held positions in the church and these were the ones that did not mind eating that pastor for lunch these are the ones that would complain about this group or that group or the bus kids now see I knew a bus kid growing up my mom was picked up by a bus and hauled to church and met Jesus amen and got saved. Now I don't know what you know it was like. I know bus kids. I know sometimes you know you you want to almost clean them up a little bit. Sometimes they you know they might need a little some new clothes because you know they're just sometimes they're just impoverished, and, or they got parents that are strung out on something and and they just want to go somewhere where they're loved. And so yeah, they're wild as monkeys. They'll run on the pews. I mean they do all kind of wild stuff. But it's precious to me to see a, a church full of little wild kids running around because they still believe in goodness. Even though they've had a horrible life, they still believe in goodness. And when somebody loves them, they know it. And they respond to that. And, and, and you'll hear people sometimes complain. We had a guy that would come into the back of the church, and he was a derelict. And he'd come in sometimes, and he was... He was just all over the place. I didn't know he spoke English for about five years. And I thought he had speech impediment. No, he's just drunk every time you saw him. And he was like, that's the way he talked. And then one day I ran into him sober and he was just crystal clear. And the reason why I ran into him, he wanted me to give him a ride to the store to buy a beer. So he could get messed up again. And I said, now I'm not going to do that, Daniel. I'm not going to. He tricked me one time. He said, you care to pull in here real quick? And I pulled in. And he got out and bought him a 12-pack and came back out. And I said, this is the last time I'm hauling you up here to get drunk. But he had a running tab in this store. And that in the, the, the trailer park behind this store, everybody there was strung out. Nobody had a license. They drove their little lawn tractors everywhere. I mean, that was the, that was the picture right up the road from where we lived. And this little store would run tabs for all the alcoholics. And when they would get their government checks, they'd go in there and pay their tab, and they'd start a brand new one. And I began to pray about that store. And I want you to know that store burnt to the ground. <laughs> and a lot of people would... And uh, we didn't do it. We did not do it. I, I, would, I wouldn't set it on fire, but it went, and by the time we left, it had not opened back up. And so that was a praise. I didn't carry any water either. Um, I wanted to get out and hoop it up in the flames, but <laughs> but I mean I, I just see where the devil gets into communities like that, and I just I want to pray about I just want to pray against these things. And somebody the people would say, Well, somebody lost their store. I said they had insurance, they got paid back for it. But it, th those kind of things. If this guy came into our church and he'd sit there and he stunk. And I had people come to me after church and say, What are we gonna do? So what do you mean what are we gonna do? Well, the pew stinks where he was sitting. And I thought, how far have we come from where we started that we could actually let those words come out of our mouth? What are we going to do? The pew stinks. Now, I said, as far as I'm concerned, recover it. Or maybe we can get a whole bunch of derelicts in here and just take the padding off and let them sit on the wood. But if they're hearing the word of God... So they can get saved and so they can get right with God and so they get cleaned up. What do we care what they smell like? And I thought, that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. That's destructive, rotten speech. And I'll tell you what it is. It's, it's contagious. 
you get around, you know, you get around complaining people, next thing you know, everybody's complaining. And we, don't, we don't have anything to complain about. But next thing you know, everybody's complaining. Everybody's got something negative to say. And then when one person starts, the next one's like, well, I, you know, I kind of feel that way too. Well, I've been wondering how everybody felt. Have you ever heard that said? Oh, it's getting ready to break open at that point. Well, I was, I was hoping somebody else felt the way I did. But sometimes it's a good thing. But a lot of times it's corrupt speech. And it has a rotting effect. Because it's contagious. And even good Christians can be led astray by rotten speech. I'll give you a good example. Peter came from Jerusalem to one of the outlying churches, um, Antioch. Peter came to Antioch when he got there. He started eating with the Gentiles. And he's having a good time. He's having him a pork sandwich every night, fried up a little bit of bacon. Peter was having a great time until some people came from James up at the mother church. The Jews came. And when they came, Peter pulled away from them and was holier than thou. He didn't even associate with the Gentiles. This is Peter that went into Cornelius' house, a Gentile, and led him to the Lord. A few years later, he's caught up in this, and Paul has to take him aside and chew him out because Paul watched his friend Barnabas, who was a godly man full of the Holy Ghost, get led astray because Peter was caught up in sin. Peter was caught up in foul speech and foul action. And he, he began to think he was too good to eat with the Gentiles because James's people were here. He wanted to make sure he stayed in good with the associational head leadership. He wanted to make sure that when the convention people got there, he was walking the line. AMS. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. And so he was pulled, he was, that's what he did. And he led Barnabas astray <laughs> by his actions. So Paul knows what he's talking about when he writes this, doesn't he? So he's not worried about profanity. He figures you get the Holy Spirit in your life, he'll clean you up. But what you need is you need to be careful of the kind of speech you use because it's contagious and it's rotten. You ever get a bag of potatoes and get it home and you didn't do the sniff test in the yeah. store? Anybody else in here sniff their taters when they take them home? <laughs> you feel them. That's, that's extreme, but yeah. If you but know I, you fish, you don't want to Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so I get a bag and, and sniff it, but every once in a while I've missed that rotten tater down in there. I was in a hurry to snatch the bag or whatever else and get it home, and it's like, woo. Yeah. And what do you do with a rotten tater? Uh, Toss it. Toss it because if you leave it in there, it's going to get the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or just if things are tight, cut off the rotten section, right? But we do, we want to get rid of the rot. You know, it's an old saying about a one rotten apple. But that's a truism, isn't it? It'll ruin a whole barrel. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. As Christians, we guard our speech. So I got one minute, and I got a couple of verses I want to read. Proverbs 23, 21 says, He who guards his mouth... And his tongue guards his soul from trouble. Better to keep your mouth shut, shut and thought a fool <laughs> than to open it and remove all doubt, right? <laughs> Proverbs 15, 2 says, The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spots folly. When we have rotten speech, we're being foolish. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are the power of the tongue. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Don't people just love gossip? Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen somebody that will gossip about somebody else to me that won't gossip about me to somebody else. If they're coming to you with gossip, you're not safe. And a lot of times they just want to find out something from you so they can go back to that other person and say, Well, guess what Rusty said about you? They won't say that they started the conversation. They usually add to it. Add to it. It gets better. They embellish it. That's for sure. Yeah. Proverbs 11, 11 says, By the blessing of the upright is a city exalted. By the mouth of the wicked is it torn down. An entire city. Think about that. Proverbs 63, 64, 3 and 4. 
who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. And this is David talking about those that were coming against him and they were lying about him. He said, who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aimed bitter speech as their arrow to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at them and do not fear. I think people, when they begin to, to talk about God's children, they begin to talk about God's elect, they begin talking about God's chosen, they, they don't, they, they've lost their fear of God. They, they've lost their respect for the Almighty because when you start messing with God's children, the Bible says they are the apple of his eye. You ever mess with somebody's grandbaby? They'll come unglued. Right, don't mess with the grandbaby. Well, that's how God feels about us. We are his peculiar possession. He, he don't want us messing with, and when we mess with each other, yeah. We, we receive what we sow. And those things come back around to get us. James 1.26 says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless or vain. So what, what's, James expects a Christian to bridle their tongue. Because he says, if you don't, your, your religion's useless. And Paul said, let no corrupting talk, none, come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up, edification. And, it, and he goes on and says, as it fits the occasion, sometimes people need encouragement. Some people are their own worst enemy. But you can't point at them and say, you're the fool that did it. Right? You're reaping what you sowed. Anybody ever want to say that to somebody? What do we do, though, when somebody comes to us and they're broken and they're in their own mess that they created? We minister to them. We encourage them. We try to help them. We try to give them the truth. And we try to tell them what the Bible says about walking in the ways of Christ. But at the same time, in the occasion, words that edify, we should choose. Because it gives grace to those that hear. How many times have you been in your own mess and you knew it was your mess, but you needed grace? You needed somebody just to handle you graciously. Because we all know when we've made our own mess. Now, some people live in a state of cognitive dissonance. They don't associate their actions with what they're going through. They're just a victim in their mind, but they've convinced themselves of that. As Christians, we're to guard our speech. Whatever we say, behind closed doors, in front of everybody, just one-on-one, -on -one, it should all be edification. As a matter of fact, this verse, Ephesians 429, is now my verse whenever I sign my name and email. It's the verse that I put. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Let none. Let it all be exhorted. It should exhort everybody that hears it. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have any discussion. Father God, I want to thank you for this moment, this time where you've given us. I thank you that throughout the years we have the writing of Paul, and that it still affects us today. Lord, I pray you'll help us to guard our speech. Father, as Paul says, if, if, if you were a thief, get a job, and then help those that are in need. And Father, using our tongue should always uplift. It should never tear down. It should be the building blocks of life. Father, may we be gracious in our speech and may we be always conscious of the things that we say because it's your command to our life. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.